About the author. Venerable Adan Mahabua, born August 12, 1913, and commonly known in Thai as Luangda Mahabua, is the common name for Pra Tharma Visuti Mongol, a revered Thai Buddhist monk. Adan, meaning teacher, is the common title for Thai monks, similar to Bhikkhu or Reshi in other Buddhist traditions. Adan Mahabua is one of the best-known Thai Buddhist monks of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. He is widely regarded as an arahant, a living Buddhist saint. He was a disciple of the esteemed forest master Adan Manpuridatta, and is now himself considered a master in the Thai forest tradition. Early Years Venerable Adan Mahabua Nyarna Sambanno was born in Bantad village, which is located in the northeastern province of Udon Thani. He was one of 17 children in a family of rice farmers. At age 21, his parents asked him to enter the monkhood for a time, as this is a Thai tradition to show gratitude towards one's parents. He chose to enter Yotanamit Monastery and was ordained on May 12, 1934, with Venerable Chao Kun Tamatedi as his preceptor, who gave him the Bali name Nyarnasambanno, which means one endowed with wisdom. He had no intention of remaining a monk for the rest of his life. After entering the monkhood, he studied the lives of the Buddha and his Arahant disciples and became so impressed that the feeling of faith arose in him, and he decided to seek the same attainments as had the original enlightened disciples of the Buddha. He sought to understand the way of practicing the Tamma which would lead to Nibbana. He sometimes passed and sometimes failed in his Pali studies. He also studied the Vinaya, the monastic rules of correct conduct. After seven years, he succeeded in passing the third level of Pali studies, and achieved the highest level in Tamma and Vinaya studies. He then aimed solely at the practice of Tamma in hopes of studying directly with Venerable Adan Man, one of the most renowned meditation masters of that time. Venerable Adan Man. He then went in search of Venerable Adan Man, and when he met him, he was pleased with his efforts since it seemed as if Venerable Adan Man already knew of his desires, intentions, and doubts. All of the questions in his mind were clarified by a Dan Man, who showed him that the paths leading to Nibbana still exist. He said to himself, Now I have come to the real thing. He has made everything clear, and I no longer have doubts. It is now up to me to be true or otherwise. I am determined to be true. He learned the methods, including meditation, followed by a Dan Man based on the principles of Buddhism and the code of Buddhist discipline. He has continued to follow these methods in his own teaching and training of monks and novices. Due to the deep respect and admiration he retains for Venerable Adan Man, whom he has likened to a father and mother to his students, he was inspired to write a biography of Venerable Adan Man aimed at disseminating his methods of practice as well as documenting his exemplary character for the sake of coming generations. Furthermore, he has written many books on the practice of Buddhist meditation, as well as many recorded teachings on Tamma so that Buddhists would have a guide in the practice of meditation. Seclusion and Establishing a Monastery In 1950, after the death of Venerable Adan Man, Adan Mahabua looked for a secluded place, settling in Huaisai village in Muktahan province. He was very strict and serious in teaching the monks and novices, both in the austere Thutanga practices and in meditation. He continued his teaching until these same principles became established amongst his followers. Learning that his mother was ill, he returned home to look after her. Villagers and relatives requested that he settle permanently in the forest south of the village and no longer wander in the manner of a forest monk. As his mother was very old and it was appropriate for him to look after her, he accepted the offer. With a donation of 64 acres of land, he began to build his monastery, Wat Ba Bantad, in November 1955. Wat Ba Bantad Ajahn Mahabua said, This monastery has always been a place for meditation. Since the beginning it has been a place solely for developing the mind. I haven't let any other work disturb the place. 
If there are things which must be done, I have made it a rule that they take up no more time than is absolutely necessary. The reason for this is that in the eyes of the world and the Tamma, this is a meditation temple. The reason for this is that in the eyes of the world and the Tamma, this is a meditation monastery. We are meditation monks. The work of the meditation monk was handed over to him on the day of his ordination by his preceptor in all its completeness. This is his real work, and it was taught in a form suitable for the small amount of time available during the ordination ceremony. Five meditation objects to be memorized in forward and reverse order, and after that, it's up to each individual to expand on them and develop them to whatever degree of breadth or subtlety he is able to. In the beginning, the work of a monk is given simply as gesa, hair of the head, loma, hair of the body, nakha, nails, danta, teeth, the zo, the skin which enwraps the body. This is the true work for those monks who practice according to the principles of Tamma, as we're taught by the Lord Buddha. The wilderness surrounding the monastery has vanished, as it has now been cleared for cultivation. The forest inside of the monastery is all that remains. Wat Ba Bantad preserves this remnant in its original condition, so that monks, novices, and lay people can use its tranquility for the practice of the Tamma as taught by the Lord Buddha. Rise to Fame Adan Mahabua has travelled to London to give lectures. He also founded the Help the Thai Nation Project, a charitable effort dedicated to helping the Thai economy. He has been visited and supported by the King and Queen of Thailand. A biographer of Adan Mahabua said, Venerable Adan Mahabua is well known for the fluency and skill of his Thamma talks and their direct and dynamic approach. They obviously reflect his own attitude and the way he personally practiced Thamma. This is best exemplified in the Thamma talks he gives to those who go to meditate at Wat Ba Bandad. Such talks usually take place in the cool of the evening, with lamps lit, and the only sound being the insects and cicadas in the surrounding jungle. He often begins the Thamma talk with a few moments of stillness, this is the most preparation he needs, and then quietly begins the Thamma exposition. As the theme naturally develops, the pace quickens, and those listening increasingly feel its strength and depth. Some Basic Teachings on the Jitta Adan Mahabua sees the essential enduring truth of the sentient being as constituted of the indestructible reality of the Jitta, heart-mind, which is characterized by the attribute of awareness or knowingness. The Jitta, which is intrinsically bright, clear, and aware, gets superficially tangled up in samsara, but ultimately cannot be destroyed by any samsaric phenomenon. Although Adzan Mahabua is often at pains to emphasize the need for meditation upon not-self, anatta, he also points out that the jitta, while getting caught up in the vortex of conditioned phenomena, is not subject to destruction, as are those things which are impermanent suffering and not-self, anitsa, dukkha, anatta. The jitta is ultimately not beholden to these laws of conditioned existence. The jitta is bright, radiant, and deathless and is its own independent reality. Being intrinsically bright and clear, the jitta is always ready to make contact with everything of every nature. Although all conditioned phenomena without exception are governed by the three universal laws of anitta, dukkha, and anatta, the jitta's true nature is not subject to these laws. The jitta is conditioned by anitta, dukkha, and anatta only because things that are subject to these laws come spinning in to become involved with the jitta, and so cause it to spin along with them. However, though it spins in unison with conditioned phenomena, the jitta never disintegrates or falls apart. It spins following the influence of those forces which have the power to make it spin, but the true power of the jitta's own nature is that it knows and does not die. This deathlessness is a quality that lies beyond disintegration. Being beyond disintegration, it also lies beyond the range of anitta, dukkha, and anatta, and the universal laws of nature. The fundamental problem that besets human beings, according to Adan Mahabua, is that they have taken false and fake things as their true self, and lack the necessary power to be their own true self. 
They allow the wiles and deceits of the mental defilements to generate fear and anxiety in their minds. Fear and anxiety are not inherent within the jitta. In fact, the jitta is ultimately beyond all such things, and indeed is beyond time and space. But it needs to be cleansed of its inner defilements, the gilesas, before that truth can be realized. Atan Mahabua states, Our real problem, our one fundamental problem, which is also the jitta's fundamental problem, is that we lack the power needed to be our own true self. Instead, we have always taken counterfeit things to be the essence of who we really are, so that the jitta's behavior is never in harmony with its true nature. Rather, it expresses itself through the Gilesa's cunning deceits, which cause it to feel anxious and frightened of virtually everything. As a result, the jitta is forever full of worries and fears. And although fear and worry are not intrinsic to the jitta, they still manage to produce apprehension there. When the jitta has been cleansed so that it is absolutely pure and free of all involvement, only then will we see a jitta devoid of all fear. Then neither fear nor courage appear, only the jitta's true nature, existing naturally alone on its own, forever independent of time and space. Only that appears, nothing else. This is the genuine jitta. Adzan Mahabua goes on to attempt to describe the inner stages and experience of the cleansed jitta. When its purgation of defilements is complete, it itself does not disappear. Only the impermanent suffering and not-self disappear. The jitta remains, experientially abiding in its own firm foundation, yet ultimately indescribable. Once the jitta has become so well cleansed that it is always bright and clear, then even though the jitta has not converged in samadhi, the focal point of its awareness is so exceedingly delicate and refined as to be indescribable. This subtle awareness manifests as a radiance that extends forth in all directions around us. We are unconscious of sights, sounds, odors, tastes, and tactile sensations, despite the fact that the jitta has not entered samadhi. Instead, it is actually experiencing its own firm foundation, the very basis of the jitta that has been well cleansed to the point where a mesmerizing, majestic quality of knowing is its most prominent feature. Seeming to exist independent of the physical body, this kind of extremely refined awareness stands out exclusively within the jitta. Due to the subtle and pronounced nature of the jitta at this stage, its knowing nature completely predominates. No images or visions appear there at all. It is an awareness that stands out exclusively on its own. This is one aspect of the jitta. Another aspect is seen when this well-cleansed jitta enters meditative calm, not thinking or imagining anything. Ceasing all activity, all movement, it simply rests for a while. All thought and imagination within the jitta come to a complete halt. This is called the jitta entering a state of total calm. Then, the jitta's essential knowing nature is all that remains. Except for this very refined awareness, an awareness that seems to blanket the entire cosmos, absolutely nothing else appears. Distance is not a factor. To be precise, the jitta is beyond the conditions of time and space, which allows it to blanket everything. Far is like near, for concepts of space do not apply. All that appears is a very refined awareness suffusing everything throughout the entire universe. The whole world seems to be filled by this subtle quality of knowing, as though nothing else exists, though things still exist in the world as they always have. The all-encompassing flow of the jitta that has been cleansed of the things that cloud and obscure it, this is the jitta's true power. The jitta that is absolutely pure is even more difficult to describe. Since it is something that defies definition, I don't know how I could characterize it. It cannot be expressed in the same way that conventional things in general can be, simply because it is not a conventional phenomenon. It is the sole province of those who have transcended all aspects of conventional reality, and thus realize within themselves that non-conventional nature. For this reason, Words cannot describe it. Why do we speak of a conventional jitta and an absolutely pure jitta? Are they actually two different jittas? Not at all. 
It remains the same jitta. When it is controlled by conventional realities, such as Gelesa and Asava, that is one condition of the jitta. But when the faculty of wisdom has scrubbed it clean until this condition has totally disintegrated, the true jitta, the true tamma, the one that can stand the test, will not disintegrate and disappear along with it. Only the conditions of anitta, dukkha, and anatta, which infiltrate the jitta, actually disappear. No matter how subtle the gilesas may be, they are still conditioned by anitta, dukkha, and anatta, and therefore must be conventional phenomena. Once these things have completely disintegrated, the true jitta, the one that has transcended conventional reality, becomes fully apparent. This is called the jitta's absolute freedom or the jitta's absolute purity. All connections continuing from the jitta's previous condition have been severed forever. Now utterly pure, the jitta's essential knowing nature remains alone on its own. Since this refined awareness does not have a point or a center, it is impossible to specifically locate its position. There is only that essential knowing with absolutely nothing infiltrating it. Although it still exists amidst the same kantas with which it used to intermix, it no longer shares any common characteristics with them. It is a world apart. Only then do we know clearly that the body, the kantas, and the zitta are all distinct and separate realities. Gamartana Gamartana literally means basis or place of work. It describes the contemplation of certain meditation themes used by a meditation monk so that the forces of defilement, gelesa, craving, tanha, and ignorance, avidza, may be uprooted from the mind. Although gammartana can be found in many meditation-related subjects, the term is most often used to identify the forest lineage, the gammartana tradition, founded by Ajahn Sao Gandasilo and his student Ajahn Manpuridatta.